Welcome to Ream Library. My name is Tom Lendy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center, the Reverend Michael C. McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Uh, the college recently named the center in honor of Father McFarland, who steps down at the end of this year after 12 years as president of the college. We're very proud to have Father McFarland's name uh, attached to the center, and uh, the standard of excellence that it sets for us in our work is, uh, is a high threshold. This afternoon, we're really pleased to welcome Father Philip Endeen, SJ. He speaks today on Ignatius Loyola and why it's not quite enough to do what Jesus would do, as the bracelets would have it. The talk is one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. It's a series that explores the place of religion, and religious and spiritual life in a world that is sometimes at odds with faith, other times in search of it, and always at work reshaping faith. You can learn more about the series and about past events on our center website at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center, all lowercase. It won't work otherwise, I learned recently. Father Endine is tutor of theology at Campion Hall, which is at the University of Oxford. He teaches courses on important 20th century theologians, Karl Barth, Karl Rahner, and Joseph Ratzinger, who we now know as Pope Benedict XVI. He's a great authority on Rahner and author of Karl Rahner and Ignatian Spirituality, published in 2001. He edited and translated Karl Rahner's spiritual writings in 2005. He's the former editor of The Way, the British Jesuits Journal of Spirituality, and continues to serve as an editorial consultant. Please join me in welcoming Father Endine. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's a very great pleasure for me to be here at Holy Cross and to be giving this lecture. And I'm particularly glad to be one of the first lecturers here after the center has been renamed in honor of Father McFarland, because I have the happiest memories of celebrating the Easter Vigil with him here in Massachusetts in 1985 one of my very first outings as a deacon, and his first Easter as a priest. It's actually not quite my first visit to Holy Cross. When I was a student in Cambridge in the mid-1980s, my community thought that my education was incomplete and that it needed to be broadened by exposure to American football. So one of my fellow scholastics was deputed to bring me here to Holy Cross one Saturday afternoon for a home football game. I did find the experience enriching and fascinating. But I have to admit that I could not make head or tail of what was happening on the field, and instead found myself simply being swept up by the enthusiasm around me to the point that I was cheering indiscriminately for both sides. <laughs> I hope on this occasion that I can behave in a culturally more appropriate manner. This afternoon, I want to talk about the ways in which we should and should not be influenced by the memory of Jesus as we try to make sense of our lives and to take sensible and prudent decisions. In particular, I want to focus on the figure of Ignatius Loyola described by one of his contemporaries as mad on the Lord Jesus. He was absolutely adamant that the society he founded was to bear not his own name, but that of Jesus, and insisted on this against several challenges. It was Jesus whom he regarded as the real founder and head of his project. His spiritual exercises lead us towards regulating our lives in such a way as to promote our salvation. And they consist, in large part, of meditations about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Ignatius's initial conversion experience led him to go to the Holy Land, the place where Jesus had lived. And in one sense, he never wanted to leave there. He would have been quite happy to have spent his life leading the life, leading the life of the apostles, imitating Christ in the Holy Land. 
He was, as we all know, of course, thrown out of the Holy Land by the Franciscan authorities, and the rest is history. And he reluctantly accepted the directive. They almost threatened him with execution. But before he went back, he returned once to the Mount of Olives, because there there was a stone, not terribly well photographed here, from which the Lord had allegedly ascended into heaven. And on this stone, you can see the final footprint. It really isn't very clear, but I suppose there's a sort of footprint there. Ignatius bribes the guards with his knife and his scissors. He even goes back a second time because he hadn't taken a proper look at where the right foot was or where the left was. When the Christian authorities find out about this exuberant demonstration of indiscreet piety, they send out a search party. When Ignatius is found, he's manhandled, roughly, by someone he calls a Christian of the cincture. But Ignatius is not perturbed. He tells us that all the time he had great consolation from our Lord. He was seeing Christ always over him. And this was lasting all the time in great abundance. Whatever else there is to be said about Ignatius of Loyola, the following of Jesus was a central hallmark of his life. One of his famous book, favorite books was the classic we now call The Imitation of Christ. And it might be thought, therefore, that Ignatian spirituality and theology might have a great deal of affinity with a movement that has become popular here in the United States, particularly among evangelicals, a moment that approaches every decision-making through the key question, what would Jesus do? WWJD. I'm afraid to say that even in the United Kingdom, you will see devout young people wearing rather gaudy wristbands with that acronym inscribed. Though WWJD is a slogan that has become popular in evangelical circles, it's attractive to the pious imagination to suppose that an appeal to how Jesus went about doing good can somehow solve the many practical questions that face us. I have to confess that one of my youthful indiscretions half a lifetime ago was an article about liturgical planning, where I argued passionately for the claim that a good liturgist, faced with choices about what music to use for this particular congregation, might in the end sensibly let go of all the practical and political arguments and just ask themselves the question, what would Jesus do? I reflect as I just say this that in my published bibliography I have suppressed that article. <laughs> <laughs> Up to a point, such an approach is not stupid. Sometimes, when you've heard arguments ad nauseam, and you just need to make a choice one way or the other, you need a technique for cutting through the arguments and reaching a point of decision. <coughs> and maybe this Jesus question is as good a mechanism for accomplishing that task as any other. But it's limited. Note two things about it. Firstly, in this sort of situation, the question, what would Jesus do, is no different from the question, what is the most sensible thing to do? About 20 years ago, the Society of Jesus in Rome produced a document called The Characteristics of Jesuit Education, which is a perfectly unexceptionable and worthy text but in an, in, an, an, in an irreverent moment, I decided to read it, cutting out the word Jesuit every time it turned up and substituting the word sensible. <laughs> and no difference was made. 
So in practice, the outcome of this sort of appeal to what Jesus would do, what a sensible companion of Jesus would do, doesn't actually have very much to do with Jesus at all. And it might be appropriate for us to be more honest about that. And secondly, when we enter the realm of what is morally controversial, it becomes clear, firstly, that we're not all that sure what Jesus did and didn't say about many topics. And secondly, that any appeal to biblical teaching or the teaching of Jesus is always, in fact, also an appeal to some other consideration. And nearly always, it's that secondary consideration that's doing the work. At the risk of undue frivolity, I make the point by showing a cartoon. Can you read that? <laughs> Dialogue. Authoritarian person. If someone in our church is sinning, they need to be dealt with biblically. So they have to be stoned to death. Uh, no, no, that's in the old part of the Bible, so that doesn't count. But isn't tithing found in that old part? Does this mean that tithing is also part of the part of the Bible that doesn't count? You don't have to pay so much. No, no, the old part about tithing is still part of the part of the Bible that we used to be biblical Christians. It's obviously from a strict Protestant sect I've lived in this. But the other part of the old part is clearly not part of the part that we used to post about being biblical Christians. So the interlocutor is getting very confused. So there are many parts of the Bible, and some parts are part of the part that we boast about following as biblical Christians, but other parts are parts that we don't follow. And, but some old parts are still part, and other parts are not part. I'm confused. Bobby, I'm sorry. It's not biblical to be confused. If you don't believe me, just read your Bible. Underlying this dialogue and that cartoon, there are a number of obvious common sense points. I'll single out three. In the first place, nobody takes everything in the Bible or in Jesus' teaching seriously, not least because the Bible sometimes contradicts itself. Secondly, there has to be some procedure for sorting out how we interpret scripture. The authoritarian here is guilty of bad faith because he's simply denying that that's the case. Now, sorting out how to interpret scripture is not an easy business, not something that we can sort out straightforwardly. But nevertheless, we cannot be Christians without being committed to that task. This is one of the reasons why Catholic Christians develop theories of the special God-given authority of the church. And though there are problems there, I suspect we cannot ultimately do without that sort of theology. Thirdly, the so-called biblical Christian who wants to punish members of his church that don't behave as he thinks appropriate is in fact invoking not the Bible or the teaching of Jesus at all, but other convictions about how he thinks Christians should behave. He's got an idea of how the Christian life should be lived, and he thinks it's always been that way. These convictions might, for all we know, be perfectly sensible and defensible in their own way. The only point to make here is that they can't be justified simply through an assertion that they are biblical. We might also bear in mind a point to which I will return towards the end, that many of those who've studied intensively the historical Jesus end up suggesting that he would have been a rather uncomfortable and subversive figure. The late professor Rick Murphy of this university a figure well-liked and remembered among the Jesuits of my country from his time as a student in London, 
had it in mind before his recent death to produce a book called What Would Jesus Really Do? The Historical Jesus and American Politics. And though we have little detailed sense of what would have gone into that book, perhaps the title suggests some affinity with this rather irreverent drawing about right-wing politicians. Now, these arguments basically about how we do our ethics are worth thinking about. And it's important that we sensible people remember that we can be manipulated by people who want to do their morality and spirituality unthinkingly. These people can often stake a claim to the intellectual high ground by attempting to commandeer words like biblical, Christian, orthodox, and traditional. With the implication that those of us who see problems rather differently are somehow less than faithful to Christian tradition somehow second-class and backsliding in our commitment. We need to be very clear that such a strategy is in fact misusing religious language to cover up what is at its best sheer laziness and its worst downright manipulation. A wise man once said that there is nothing so untraditional as a traditionalist. Tradition requires rather than excludes our intelligent participation and cooperation. <laughs> Nevertheless, you'll be glad to hear that in this lecture, I don't want to stay with this essentially negative approach to the shortcomings of WWJD as a guideline for our lives. Instead, I want to return to Ignatius Loyola and make a more positive case. I began this lecture by invoking Ignatius's devotion to Jesus in all its passion and radicality. Nevertheless, the message that I want to get across in the main body of what I want to say this afternoon is that Ignatius was not a simple subscriber to WWJD. His relationship with Jesus was, of course, central. And his hope in writing the exercises might well be expressed in the words of the slightly crazy woman whom he remembered meeting during his time in Manresa. The woman who said to him, may it please our Lord Jesus Christ to appear to you. This is the wish that Jesus appear to us, that Ignatius addresses to anyone who offers themselves generously and with magnanimity to his school of prayer. But at the same time, it's not quite enough to do what Jesus would do. Even for Ignatius, mad as he was on the Lord Jesus, more is involved. There's a well-known story about a catechism class in the north of England. One day, a new teacher came to the group. And she came in and she asked the class a question. What's brown and furry and climbs up trees? Jesus, the class replied. <laughs> no, don't be silly. Silence, and then eventually one of the child said, but it's got to be Jesus. Why? Well, it's a catechism class, and if it's catechism, then Jesus is the answer to every question. <laughs> ah, said the teacher, that was only true with your last teacher. I want to tell you something different. Jesus is, of course, very important, and that's why we're having a catechism class. But there's a secret. He's not the answer to every question. That's to make the point through a rather naff story. Let's enhance the intellectual tone a bit by taking a sentence from a theology book, indeed one of the great theological texts of the last century. 
Karl Rahner's Grundkurs des Glaubens, known to its friends in the English-speaking world as Foundations of Christian Faith. <laughs> Near the beginning of the book, he comes out with the suggestive sentence that the normally admirable and reliable English translation rather mangles. Here it is in my version. There's a knowledge of God which is more than what the encounter with Jesus Christ provides. There's more to God than meeting Jesus, than dealing with Jesus. Jesus is certainly important, but he is not the answer to every question. And with that, I want to start looking at how Ignatius encourages us to pray with the Gospels in the course of the spiritual exercises. Let me begin with what he says about how Scripture should be presented. The person who gives to another the way and order in which to meditate or contemplate ought to relate faithfully the events of such contemplation or meditation, going over the points with only a short or summary development. For if the person who's contemplating takes the true foundation, which is the story, working on it and thinking about it on their own, and finds something which makes them understand or feel for the story a little more, it is better than if the one who gives the exercises had explained and expanded the meaning of the story a great deal. There are many interesting things in this paragraph, which comes right at the beginning of the book. And there might be a prize for the student who can tell me what I have left out, but not for the faculty. Just at this moment, I want to stress how Ignatius is actually telling the person giving the exercises to be boring. When you are doing this sort of presentation of the Bible, you should try to be low-key, unattractive. You should avoid the temptation of trying to display the charms of your charismatic personality. Because what's meant to be happening is that the one receiving the exercises isn't just receiving instruction. They're meant to be discovering something for themselves. They are not there, in other words, to get your take on the biblical message. That can happen in some lectures. But they're there, rather, to encounter that message in freedom as an invitation, as something demanding their response. If this style of communication of the gospel goes well, something new should be happening. <coughs> something which the text might provoke or catalyze, but something which is more than simply doing what the text tells you. Something more than trying to do in your own time what Jesus did in his. You let that happen in its own way. You present the story, the points, briefly. And you let the gospel do the work. Rather than present to you Ignatius's instructions in full, I'm going to follow the spirit of his injunction to be brief. And I want to reduce them to seven bullet points. With some qualifications and exceptions that we can leave aside, the basic structure of Ignatian prayer involves a prayer for God to act in me as God wills. <coughs> 
it involves telling the story. It involves placing myself alongside it, asking for what I want, then thinking about what they look like, what they're saying, and what they're doing, reflecting and drawing profit from that. A colloquy, asking according to what I feel in me. And then finally, what is referred to as repetition. And as every Ignatian director always says, repetition doesn't mean repetition. It doesn't mean doing it again. But more on that in a minute. So notice, number two there, you have the story. But it's embedded in much else. The process involves a lot more. And virtually all that lot more is underdetermined by what the story actually says. For a start, you place yourself alongside it. The Spanish there is composición viendo el lugar. Composition, seeing the place. Standard English jargon in Ignatian circles has been, we do the composition of place. Those of you who are reading English might know a book by Lewis Martz called The Poetry of Meditation, in which composition of place is a major theoretical category. But what on earth does it mean? We have little hard evidence about Ignatius's language, apart from his own texts because he was writing at a time when the language was changing vastly and when ethnic identities in Spain were being readjusted. I suspect that in the English-speaking world, we probably think it means something like compose oneself, settle down into an activity of prayer, put yourself in the presence of God. And frankly, for all we know, that might be right. But at the same time, it's often helpful to read Ignatius's Spanish in terms of the Latin roots of the words. And in that case, composición might mean co-placing, placing oneself alongside. Bring yourself into this world, which is, of course, what you do later in the exercise anyway. At any rate, certainly by the time that we get to the main points, it's clear that Ignatius does not regard the biblical text as simply carrying an objective truth that we have to internalize as if it were written in a catechism. Rather, we place ourselves within the scene, and at each of the main points, we reflect and draw profit. So what about this reflecting and drawing profit? The English word reflect has two senses. To reflect as a mirror reflects, and to reflect as in thinking about, reflecting on. Modern Spanish does those jobs with two different words, reflexionar and reflejar. But it seems likely that the Spanish of Ignatius's day, like modern English, had only the one word, though Ignatius typically spells it in a variety of different ways. He, he was never good on either syntax or spelling. <laughs> Refletir. And it seems to me that when Ignatius wants us to reflect, he wants us to do so in both English senses of the word. The other place where he talks about reflecting comes towards the end of the exercises when Ignatius is encouraging us to think about the love of God and to participate in it. Ignatius asks us to consider different ways in which God is good to us. The, many, the benefits received of creation, redemption, and particular gifts. Pondering with much feeling how much God our Lord has done for me how much he's given me of what he has. 
and how likewise the same Lord, according to his divine ordination, is desiring to give me himself as much as he can. A narrative story of God's goodness. And with this to reflect on or in myself, considering with much reason and justice what I ought on my side to offer and give to his divine majesty. That is to say, everything that is mine and myself with it, as one who makes an offering with much feeling, take, Lord, receive all my liberty, and so on. That's the other place in the exercises where Ignatius is using this word reflect. I mean, with a lot of Ignatius's keywords, we have very little evidence, and basically interpreters have to guess. They don't always tell you they're guessing. My guesses at least depend on trying to bring these two uses together. But here, there is clearly a sense, both of the fact that there is a story about which we have to think, but also that in our own way, we should continue that story. We should reflect it. We should act in a way that somehow mirrors it. I would suggest that that meaning of reflecting and drawing profit is present throughout the exercises, at every point. We are, made, we are supposed to be pondering the story we're told about and then respond to it, reflecting it for ourselves. We are to become participants in the story, to get to know it from inside, and to follow its central character wherever he may be leading us. We can bring out the point a little further by looking at another key idea in Ignatius's the techniques for prayer, that of the colloquy, the kind of imaginative conversation that Ignatius encourages us to hold at the end of the prayer with any one of the characters in the scene asking according to what I feel in me. I'm not asking according to what I ought to feel, asking according to what I actually feel. If you're making this kind of prayer, you'll be responding to it in the way that's right for you. And hence this final phase, which has traditionally been taken to be the heart and center of the whole process, will in fact be utterly personal and unpredictable. The story will be leading you to a new place. We do actually have an early version in Latin of about half of the exercises, probably written by one of the first 10 Jesuits, Jean Cordour, who died in 1541. So it's a very early text. It's close to Ignatius, though in some alarming ways, it shows that his companions did not understand him very well. Whereas Ignatius' own texts are terse, Codeurs go on for pages. And they seem to present what Codeur would be giving to some hapless retreat giver who was listening to his lectures. Nevertheless, Codeur's interpretation of the colloquy at the end of the contemplation is very suggestive. Here, set out what you want. Not because you need to teach God. God knows perfectly well what you want before you came to prayer in the first place. But in order to inflame your own mind with a greater desire of this gift as you name it and explain it verbally. <coughs> you do the prayer of petition in order to sharpen your own sense of desire. That gets round many of the intellectual problems with petitionary prayer. And it's a strategy that can be traced back at least to St. Augustine. In this version of the exercises, it seems clear that what's expected to happen is that reading the gospel, though it's important, should also get us in touch with and perhaps specify our desires, our wishes, our longings, the currents that are living within us from our history. Note, too, 
that the expression of our desires and an openness to the possibility that God might have other ideas for us are also part of that key Ignatian structure. Though we do not need to tell God about these desires, becoming aware of them for ourselves might help us begin to live our way, lives in <coughs> tune with what we really want, with our deepest selves, rather than according to what convention and duty are making us. At this point, we might quote another of Ignatius' instructions, the last of those seven bullet points, about repetition. Ignatius defines repetition as not doing it again, but rather returning to the text at the place where something happened, where the part of you that is growing, that is being challenged, was somehow being touched. The place where you experienced greater consolation or desolation or greater spiritual feeling. I suggest we put that alongside an instruction that we find a little bit later in the book, where he says, at the point at which I find what I want, there I'll rest without being anxious to pass on until I content myself. If you look at the book of the exercises, you might get a headache. There seems to be an endless succession of repetitions, colloquies, reflections, and all the rest of it. But it's a mistake to read it as a classroom syllabus, which we need to start at the beginning and carry, through, carry on with until we reach the end, making sure we have learnt everything and covered it thoroughly. Rather, when we've begun to learn something, when our imagination has somehow been caught and our heart stirred, then we should break off. <coughs> when Ignatius sets out the points of contemplation schematically and boringly, inviting us to consider what the figures in the scene are looking like, what they're saying and what they're doing, his intention is not to exercise exhaustively and exhaustingly every possible use of the imagination. The reason why he's being so comprehensive, rather, is that he's leaving scope for each person to find the detail that they need and then take the process further from there. When we come back to prayer, when we do what the jargon calls a repetition of this kind of exercise, we don't simply do it again. We don't repeat in the standard English speak of the word, sense of the word. We do something closer to the root Latin sense. Repetitio in Latin might well mean seeking again or asking, petitioning again. We start at the points where we found something beginning to happen and we move on from there. So, the seven elements here show that much more is happening in Ignatian prayer than are simply repeating or reproducing what Jesus said or did. Though he is at a central, pivotal point in our reflections, he's there not just for us to learn what he tells us, he's there somehow to stimulate something new in us. He may be central to our life under God, but he's not the whole of that life. He's not, despite what many pious people think, the answer to every question. There's more to the knowledge of God than an encounter with Jesus Christ. When we pray to Christ through the Gospels, there's always a kind of extra. Any authentic Christology is always a Christology plus. I've been trying to say all this very simply, and 
keeping us close to the sorts of things that happen when we actually make an Ignatian retreat. But it might be appropriate now for me to introduce you to two sentences from the Christology of Karl Rana, which put this point in a more academic and philosophical idiom. Try saying this at a dinner party. <laughs> Although the hypostatic union is also a once and for all event in its own essence, it only happened once. And viewed in itself, it's the highest conceivable event. Nevertheless, it's a moment within the whole. The whole which is the gracing of the self-conscious creation in general. Slightly less tortuously, grace in all of us and hypostatic union in the one Jesus Christ. I mean, perhaps I should explain that hypostatic union is old-fashioned Catholic speak for what was special about Jesus. <laughs> These can only be considered together. So the story of Jesus' specialness and the story of God's grace in us, we don't get either of them right unless we take them together. And as one reality, they signify the one free decision of God for the supernatural order of salvation, for God's self-communication. The point is, Jesus is important, but he's important as a beginning, a foundation. Note Ignatius' phrase, the true foundation which is the story. And it means that those of us who try to follow him should not even try simply to repeat what he's begun, but rather take the story forward. All of us, not just Jesuits or even Jesuits and their groupies, are called to be companions of Jesus, those who share his life in freedom. And there is an important difference between being a companion and being a clone. We are not called to be Jesus' clones. I referred earlier to scholarship on the historical Jesus, which in fact suggests that Jesus might have appeared to us as very alien and very strange, even unattractive. This is not material on which I can pretend to be expert, but nevertheless I can evoke one classic figure in this tradition, the figure of Albert Schweitzer. Not only a biblical scholar, but also a philosopher, medical doctor, virtuoso organist, and humanitarian. His survey of the history of the German 19th century quest for the historical Jesus was taken for a couple of generations as having completely discredited the project. For Schweitzer, Jesus was a prophet of the imminent coming of the world's end. Pretty well the equivalent of the madman in the street who says the end of the world is nigh. The 19th century to attempt to take him as a model of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and it was man, was projecting a vision of an ethical teacher that, as he put it, never had any existence. <laughs> We looked at the ideal of the historical Jesus and we found our own ideal, not him. He was an uncomfortable, convulsive figure. The trouble with ethical reflection that appeals to Jesus to legitimate its values is that it cannot avoid projecting the reader's own ideals onto the figure of Jesus, with the result that the claim to be appealing to what the real Jesus would have done is an illusion, particular, and it's a dangerous one if it's part of any aggressive moral program. The reflection on the life of Jesus has its place in the Christian life only in conjunction with something else, something which led Schweitzer to give up his comfortable life in Germany, retrain as a doctor, 
and give his life to lepers in Liberia. And Schweitzer evokes this reality in romantic terms that might be criticized today, but are surely still powerful. As he puts it, the abiding and eternal in Jesus is absolutely independent of historical knowledge and can only be understood by contact with his spirit, which is still at work in the world. In proportion as we have the spirit of Jesus, we have the true knowledge of Jesus. And although that claim is a little extreme, it's worth quoting the passage with which the book ends. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name. As of old, by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow thou me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands. And to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings, the peace which they will pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. Schweitzer's complete dismissal of historical study of Jesus goes too far. But he is surely right to point out that it is only in conjunction with something else, a spirit that is still at work in the world, that we can discover in any meaningful or helpful sense who Jesus is. Something which happens in and through our own decisions, in and through our experience as an ineffable mystery, whether or not we are wise or foolish. And for that reason, it won't quite do to ask what Jesus did. Ignatius himself, in the Kingdom Meditation, points us along the way. He tells us that we are helped to understand the heavenly king by considering the earthly king. And that's all he says. Many Jesuit sermons, though perhaps less so in the egalitarian democracy of the US than in Europe, have got excited about the figure of Christ the King and encouraged young men, normally his men, to be generous and heroic in his service. But look at Ignatius's text. He follows the pattern of the gospel and he follows the debate about kingship that runs all the way through both testaments. Just as Mark takes us beyond the wonder worker of Galilee with his healings and exorcisms riding around the place like Clint Eastwood, and confronts us with a hero figure who will work somehow differently, somehow more darkly, through the enigmas of betrayal and death. So Ignatius strings us along for two thirds of the meditation, but then confronts us with the fact that following this king, this ideal figure, won't be straightforward. It will land us with poverty and with insults. It won't just be fun and triumph. Discovering the leading of the Lord is not something which happens from the ideal image or the past alone. It happens in a mysterious interplay between the stories we hear and the abiding presence of God and the Son and the Spirit in our lives here and now. Jared Manley Hopkins ended one of his most famous poems with the assertion, I am all at once what Christ is, since he is what I am. A statement that in some sense he was indeed doing what Christ would have been doing. When challenged in a letter about this poem, however, he said something rather different. The poem had claimed to be echoing the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. And his correspondent, his friend and later editor Robert Bridges, remarked intelligibly enough, intelligently enough, 
that there was a huge difference between Hopkins's exuberant poetry and the enigmatic fragments we have of Heraclitus and other pre-Socratic philosophers. And Hopkins retorted with the line, of course what I wrote was not Heraclitian, but the effect of me on me of reading great masters, masterpieces <coughs> is to make me admire and then do otherwise. The following of Christ, whether in the Ignatian tradition or beyond, is a mysterious and complex process. Ultimately, because the Christ we follow is both the man of Nazareth who lived among us in the past and the risen Lord who continues to be drawing us on into the future. To draw close to him, we have to reflect and draw profit. It's a slow process. It may have many detours. It involves both imitating him and yet also doing otherwise. In everything apart from our sinfulness, our differences from Christ are just as important and significant under God as our similarities to him. Within that complexity, there is certainly a place for the what would Jesus do question. But it's part of a whole, and it won't do quite, won't quite do just to stay there.